Good morning and good afternoon to everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Reliable Antifungal Susceptibility Testing with Micronaut AM According to UCAST Standards. I'm Christy Jewell of Laberts and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Laberts and sponsored by Bruker Microbiology and Diagnostics. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit Bruker.com. Now we encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the ask a question box and click send. We will answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical questions here as well. Now I would like to welcome today's speaker, Alex Cost, PhD, FAMH, Clinical Bi Microbiologist, University Hospital, Lausanne. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Alex, you may now begin your presentation. So thank you for the nice introduction. My name is Alex Kost uh, and I present you uh, our study entitled A Comparative Evaluation of Micronaut AM Using Antifungal Resistance Genes to Overcome Differences Between UCAST and CLSI. So this study uh, was performed in our laboratory located at the University Hospital Lausanne, so-called CHUV, uh, which is one of the five university hospitals in Switzerland. Yes, Switzerland is a small country. Um, and this hospital is collaborating with the Faculty of Biology and Medicine of the University of Lausanne. Uh, that you can see here. And our institute, the Institute of Microbiology, is located in this small house here and on the 19th floor and 18th floor of uh, the main building. So in our institute, uh, we have about 120 employees which are dedicated, we, who are dedicated to three main activities. So the uh, diagnostic uh, in microbiology, uh, but also applied and fundamental research and teaching. So the diagnostic section uh, of our institute is performing a wide range of in vitro diagnostic tests in the field of bacteriology, microbacteriology, parasitology, serology, virology, and mycology, as you will see today, and um, molecular diagnostic also. So the work I present you today was performed by uh, Nicolas, uh, Nicolas Pelaton, who was my uh, master student in 2020. And uh, the, some experiments were confirmed and continued by a technician in our diagnostic lab, Nathan Schlechten. And this was published, uh, as you can see here. So as all of you know, um, we estimate the fungal kingdom uh, at about 1.5 million different species. And among them, we estimate that around 300 species could provoke uh, disease uh, in human people. And uh, indeed, uh, globally, uh, we uh, can more or less uh, estimate that 300 uh, million people are afflicted with a serious fungal infection and that 25 million at, are, are at high risk of dying or losing their sight. So um, this is more than uh, the people suffering cancer, AIDS, TB or asthma altogether. And um, what is astonishing with uh, infectious, um, infection due to fungus is that they can go from very superficial disease, quite benign, to very severe one, uh, essentially in immunocompromised patients that are life-threatening. And we also uh, recently also, um, have a fungal infection associated with COVID-19, which could be really severe. Um, we uh, evaluated uh, that the mortality due to uh, invasive fungal infection varies between 15 to 70 percent, depending on, on the type of those infections. And uh, there is an estimation of 1.5 million deaths per year due to fungal infection. So it's not uh, just a, a, a little problem. To fight against this uh, infection, um, 
uh, antifungal drugs were developed since the uh, mid uh, 20th century with uh, development of amphotericin B at first. Then we had flucetuzine and uh, azoles uh, class start to be released uh, at the beginning of 80s and uh, a major improvement was done with uh, fluconazole uh, in, in beginning of 90s. And uh, finally, candines were released on the market beginning of the 21st century, as you can see here in red. However, at the same time, uh, as antifungals were developed, the uh, resistance arise. And here on the right, you can see uh, the level of um, Candida glabrata um, antifungal resistance, um, which were isolated in bloodstream infection. Um, and you 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 see that a long time uh, this this candida glabrata acquire resistance to the different uh, drugs. So here you see the candines, and here the uh, on the bottom you can see the candines, and above you can see the hazels, uh, which uh, there is much more resistance to hazels. And on the gray part you can see that there is some strains which uh, have. Uh, which are multi-drug resistant. Um, and uh, this is particularly true also, not only for Candida glabrata, but also for Candida auris, uh, the new kid on the blocks of the Candida, which was isolated for the first time into a nine in Japan, and uh, which is now uh, present all over the world and which really often present multi-drug resistance, for example, to azoles and candines, uh, and also sometimes to amphotericin B. But this resistance is not uh, restricted to Candida glabrata or Oris, but also to all, all uh, um, the different uh, fungi. And here you have a map uh, you see, um, which will um, highlight the, the, the rise of resistance amongst here uh, Candida albicans, glabrata, Cryptococcus neoformans, and um, Aspergillus fumigatis all together. So, Okay, so you can see that you have seen that this resistance arise all over the world for all these uh, four uh, species, and it's not true only for those species, but for much, much more. Um, so to, to fight against resistance, we have to understand how the drug acts first. So um, there is uh, the, the drug, um, the three major, sorry, the three major class of antifungals acts on the uh, the cell membrane and the, 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 the cell wall, sorry. So in the class, in the case of uh, azoles, uh, they will act on, on the cell membrane's ant integrity as they will uh, bind an enzyme called uh, ERG11, which is involved in the synthesis of ergosterol, uh, which is the major sterol uh, in fungi. So fungi have uh, ergosterol instead of cholesterol. And so if they um, block this enzyme, there is no more ergosterol uh, synthesized uh, in the fungal cells. Polyanes uh, bind directly to ergosterols and the, the binding of uh, amphotericin B, which is the main polyanes used, uh, will lead to uh, a leaky membrane and the death uh, of, the, of the cells. The candines, uh, as I said, will act on the cell wall and particularly the cell wall uh, biosynthesis. They will uh, bind, in fact, to an enzyme called FKS1. And in case of Candida glabrata, there is two, two genes, FKS1 and FKS2. And um, once the candine block this enzyme, this will impair the synthesis of beta-1,3 glucan, which is the, the main component of the, the cell wall of, of uh, fungus. Um, the resistance mechanisms to this uh, different antifungal are depicted here on the right. So um, there could be due the, the resistance could be due to mutation in the target of antifungal drugs such as ERG11 or uh, FKS1 or 2, uh, which leads to a decrease of binding affinity with the drug. Uh, the second mechanism could be um, um, a diminution of the of the target content or 
a modification of the metabolism of the fungus. Uh, for example, uh, if you have mutation in, in enzymes that um, are involved in the biosynthesis of ergosterol, there is no more ergosterol, for example, and then uh, for, uh, amphotericin B could not bind anymore to ergosterol. The, the third mechanism is the, the increase uh, of the drug target expression uh, due to mutation in the transcription factor regulating um, the expression of the genes encoding this, this uh, drug target. Here we have UPC2, for example, which regulate the expression of LD11, that which can be mutated. And finally, uh, the, the resistance could be due to an increased expression of efflux pump um, and this you will have a reduction of intracellular accumulation of the drugs and this is due to mutation in a uh, transcription factor here TAC1 or, or MR1 which control the expression of uh, this multi-drug um, pump. Okay, so um, so it is important uh, to, to, to assess antifungal susceptibility, as you can see, as resistance is, is rising. And for that, we need to, to detect this, uh, this resistance or a diminution of susceptibility. And as you can see on the left of my slide, we don't have a rapid molecular test to do so um, because there is uh, too many genes involved in the resistance and in each genes we have too many mutations so it's not possible to have a single molecular test to um, to detect antifungal resistance so we are now limited we are still limited to use a phenotypic um, detection of uh, antifungal resistance and um, for that, we follow two major protocols, so either the ECAST or the CLSI protocol. However, these methods, uh, especially as you can see uh, on the right, the um, growth micro dilution susceptibility testing is really time consuming and sometimes difficult to read. And so thus, we urgently need uh, to have easy to handle tests in our routine laboratories. And uh, up to now, we have uh, on the market two micro dilution commercial methods. The, as you see on the left, the yeast one, Sensitre, uh, which is uh, which follow the the CLSI protocol and which should be interpreted with the CLSI criteria. And on the right, there is the Micronaut AM, which follow and the UCAS protocol and which should be interpreted with the UCAS uh, criteria. So here I, I put on that slide the difference of, uh, of uh, the protocols here in red uh, between uh, CLSI and UCAST. And you see that there is major difference in terms of inoculum, but also in terms of growth medium. And here another thing which makes a big difference between the two protocols and the two consortia is the criteria of interpretation. So here it's a kind of a summary of the different criteria existing for both of them. So you see in this table uh, either the, the epidemiological cutoff value or the breakpoints. And uh, you see that for each species there is a uh, on the left, the CLSI criteria, and on the right, the UCAS criteria. And you see that there is a lot of blank cells in this uh, Excel table, and it's because there is no criteria. So you see that um, even if from CLSI we have criteria, you, we don't have them for UCAS and vice versa. And for some, we don't have any uh, criteria at all, neither for CLSI nor UCAS. So in this study, we, we wanted to compare these two uh, micro dilution commercial methods. So the yeast one sensitizer, which was read by I and interpreted with the CLSI criteria, and the Micronaut AM read by I or with a spectrophotometer, and uh, which was interpreted uh, with UCAS criteria um, by high, when we read by high, or automatically with the software in our um, spectrophotometer and computer. 
So to do so, we used a collection of 97 strains uh, covering 19 different yeast species, uh, essentially Candida species, including Candida albicans, Glabrata, Lusitiani, and Oris, Cryptococcus species, one Saccharomyces cerevisiae strain, and one Saprocate clavata. And we uh, analyzed the data for eight of the nine antifungal drug tested, as you can see here in black, and the fly, five flucytosines in gray was not uh, analyzed in, in our uh, study, as it's a drug which is quite no more used in clinic. Okay, so first we just compared uh, probably the MIC we obtained with both uh, method uh, read by eye. So here it's a table summarizing that. So you can see that on the top, we have the overall comparison, and then we detail this comparison by species. So if we focus on the overall comparison, we estimated that uh, one dilution difference between the two methods uh, is acceptable. So it's why uh, you see on the right of this table that we have the percent, the global percent of equal or one dilution apart uh, comparison. And you see that overall uh, around 67% of the MIC were uh, comparable or identical between the two methods, uh, meaning that one third of the MIC were really different between the two methods. This leads us to think, and yeah, in red here, I indicated the drug for which it's the more, uh, the, the difference is the more severe. Let's say voriconazole, posaconazole, and mecafungin. So this leads us to, to understand that the MIC could not be directly compared at at the end, they are not interpreted the same way. So for that, so to, 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 to do the comparison, we decided to define categories based on the MIC's dilution, respectively to breakpoints or to ECOF ECV, if they were available for both consortia. Let me explain you how we did. So if uh, we had only a unique breakpoint or ECOF ECV, um, we, we decide that this uh, breakpoint or ECV will be dilution zero. And one dilution below or one dilution above this uh, MIC value will be considered as uh, intermediate. So this will be in the category intermediate. Then if the MIC we obtain was uh, 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 more than one dilution uh, above this uh, breakpoint or a cough, uh, or the, let's see, two or three dilution above, this will be in the resistant category. And if it's four or more than four, it will be in the highly resistant category. And the same for the MIC below um, the, the breakpoint or the ECOF ECV. Okay, then it will be a sensitive category or the highly sensitive category. And if sometimes we have two breakpoints, this means that you know that uh, we have a breakpoint below which the strain is considered as susceptible or above which uh, the second breakpoint above which the, the strain is considered as um, resistant. So in this case, what we take is that we take one dilution below the susceptible breakpoint and one dilution above the resistant breakpoint to define the intermediate uh, category. Okay, so now if we have one MIC in, with one, um, with one uh, techniques, uh, which is in the intermediate, for example, category and in the resistant one for the second test, it, we consider that as a minor error. If we have more than two categories uh, difference, we have a major error. And if we have more than three categories difference, we consider that as a very major error. And with that, um, so here is the table I'll show you before. And remember that there is a lot of blank cells. So with that, we could compare only 22% of our observation uh, based on breakpoint, 49.6% based on ECOF ECV, and more than 
50% of our observation could not be compared due to lack of criteria, at least in one of the two consortia, if not in both. Okay. So we could only, uh, um, then we could only um, compare data for, uh, let's say, two thirds of what we, we, we have as, as uh, records. So then we did some contingency tables to compare the Micronaut uh, MIC and the yeast 11 which were categorized, okay? And you see that we have um, on, the, on, the, on the right of this contingency table, you see it's written accuracy. And you see that only 52%, uh, we have only 52% of accuracy between the two methods which is really low and but we have a uh, few major error only two but a lot of uh, sorry we had only two very major error and the majority of difference was due to major minor error or major error and this is for a breakpoint as you can see on the top um on the top of the slide and on the bottom of the slide it's the same thing but with uh, ECV ECOF as um, as criteria then you see that the accuracy is also very low around 55 percent so at that time we wonder if our approach was valid and was able to see the similarity between uh, data so what we did is that we then compared the MIC we obtained with the micronaut um, uh, visual reading or the mic which is here indicated by m and v and with the uh, micronaut read with the spectrophotometer which is indicated here by mn and you see that in this case there is very few uh, major error and very major error and that the accuracy in this case is uh, of uh, 90 percent and uh, which is data obtained with breakpoint as, as criteria. And on the bottom, you see the same with uh, ECV ECOF uh, as criteria. And it's the same. We have uh, an accuracy around uh, 90% and uh, almost no very major error and very few major and minor error. So meaning that our approach was valid. But this approach showed that whatever we can do, the, the comparison based on MIC and comparison of MIC, either raw MIC or categorization of MIC was not a, a good way to, to compare the two, the two methods. So yeah, it, this was our first conclusions. A huge effort is still needed to complete interpretation criteria in both consortia. Remember all these black cells in our table. And as I said, that the comparison of CLSI versus UCAST growth micro dilution susceptibility testing is absolutely not trivial and cannot be done by direct MIC comparison, neither by categorization. So this leads us to take another approach uh, to be able to compare the results we obtained by CLSI or UCAST protocol, let's say by um, yeast, yeast one uh, sensitizer or uh, micronaut AM. So for that, um, we decided to use information we had on the resistance uh, genes. Let's say all the genes I presented you before. And to do so, uh, we decided to evaluate the concordance between TIST1 uh, sensitizer and Micronaut AM using 50 strains, which were genetically characterized for the, the antifungal resistant genes. So 22 Candida albicans, 18 Candida gabbrata, 5 Candida lusitani, and 5 Candida auris. Today, I present you the data only for Candida albicans and Candida gabbrata. Those strains were sampled before and after several days of treatments and or isolated in the breakthrough episodes. And um, we determined the point mutation responsible for resistance uh, in the resistance uh, genes of the resistance strains as compared to the isogenic susceptible strains sampled at the beginning of the treatment in a single patient. And we thus observed it, if a MIC elevation could be measured 
for the corresponding drugs with both methods in the strain containing, uh, in the resistant strain containing mutations. Okay, so I'll just remind you. Uh, so first we will look at the hazard data, and I just remind you how what the gene involved in the resistance. So here it's the azole susceptible yeast. So the azoles enter its cell, bind to the Erg11 um, uh, enzyme, and the Erg11 enzyme, once blocked, uh, could no more lead to biosynthesis of ergosterol, but instead to this 14 alpha methyl 36 diol, which is a toxic compound. So it, what we can have, I remind you, is that we can have a mutation in the target, ERG11. So ERG11 is one of the resistance genes. We can have mutation in UPC2 controlling the ex expression of ERG11. We can also have mutation in um, TAC1 or MRR1, which are regulating the expression of the mutual drug transporter genes. The, yeah. And but we can also have mutation in other um, in other uh, genes uh, involved in the sterol biosynthesis. This is important because in this case, for example, if F3 is mutated, you have no more synthesis of this toxic compound and the strain can still grow. Okay. And for some strains, we have uh, some, uh, you will see that you will, you will see that several st strains show very high uh, MICs, and it's because they um, have um, acquisition of several mutations in several resistance genes. Okay, so here are the data we obtained. So let let me explain you this table. So in a in a single square, you see that you have three different strains. Let's say here DSY twenty three twenty one in black and two red strain, DSY 2322 and DSY 2323. So the DSY 2321 in black was the susceptible strain, which was recovered from patient one uh, before the beginning of the treatment. And the following strain were sampled uh, after several weeks of treatment. So first the 2322 and then the 2323. And you see that in the susceptible strain, the black one, there is no mutation, uh, neither in TAC1 or UPC2. But you see here this little star. This means that we had a mutation, but in only one copy of the ERG11 gene. I just remind you that Candida albicans is uh, diploid and um, that we need to have a mutation in both copy of the genes to see um, to have expression of the mutation. You see that in the first uh, red strain, 22-22, we have mutation in the TAC1 gene and in the ERG11 gene. This time, the mutation is homozygote, meaning it's present in both copy of uh, those genes. And you see that in the third strain on the top, we have mutation in UPC2. Now, if we look at the MIC, you see that we indicated the MIC for the different drug, voriconazole, posaconazole, itraconazole, and fluconazole, for the susceptible strain. And we indicate it by plus 5, for example, and the color. This means that the MIC of the first red strain, 23-22, uh, is uh, at 5 dilution uh, more than the susceptible strain. Okay. And on, for each drug, you see on the left YO, meaning yeast one. This is the data we obtain with the yeast one. And on the right, you see M and V. This is the data we obtain for Micronaut and both read by visually. And you see for all the strains that as soon as you have mutation, you have an increase in the MIC, both for yeast one and for M and V. And when we look at the mean MIC increase for each drug, you see that there is no major difference between uh, yeast 1 or MNV. If you look at the bottom of each table, you can see mean MIC increase. And if you compare the two columns for each drug, you don't see a major difference between them. And so we did that for Candida albicans strains. And on the uh, B table, we did that also for a Candida garbratra uh, couple of strains. 
So then we did the same with the candines. So I just remind you that the resistance to uh, candines was due to a mutation in the target of the candines encoded by gene FKS1, but also FKS2 for Candida glabrata only. And on the bottom, you can see that there is two hotspots where the mutation uh, responsible for resistance are located. And um, on color, I indicated the position, uh, well, the amino acid involved in this resistance. And we identified that uh, you see here uh, on this table that some uh, mutation in FKS1 or FKS12 for Candida glabrata were present when there is a cross. So you see that for Candida albicans, we have only one uh, couple of isogenic strains. And then we have, um, let's say, single strains. This means that we don't have the isogenic one. Uh, as these strains were isolating during a breakthrough episode uh, and we don't have the, the, the susceptible uh, strain before beginning of the treatment. Okay, so here we just put an R as the, the MIC were really high for both yeast one and uh, Malchronaut. And here again, it's the same principle. Uh, you, you have the MIC for the susceptible strain and then you have the elevation of MIC for the, the, the strain bearing mutation. And you see again, when you look at the MI, mean MIC increase at the bottom of the table, that the increase of MIC in the resistance strain for both uh, systems are comparable. So then uh, our last question was, uh, does it exist a difference between the Micronaut AM red visually or um, uh, by the spectrophotometer and interpreted with the software. So here is the result. It's exactly the same as we did before uh, comparing the Roly, the, the MIC. So you have um, for Candida albicans and Candida garbrata, azoles or echinocandines uh, MICs. And you see that uh, we consider that no difference in the MIC between the two uh, way to read uh, the micronaut or one dilution, it's comparable. And you can see that more than 97% uh, of the MICs were similar uh, if the, the plate were read visually or spectrophotometrically. And uh, it's true for candida albicans with azoles and canines. And for gabrata, it's a bit lower, but still very good. We have 95% of the MIC, which are identical uh, between visual or spectrophotometrically reading of the plate, and 92.2% for canines. So there is, and when there is difference, there is no change in the interpretation. Uh, for, for this uh, MIC. Uh, here it's the same, uh, but here it's presented uh, not by strains, but by drug. And you see that uh, we have 90% of the observation that is uh, the same. Uh, all all um, um, strains we read um, confounded, 90% of the MIC were identical if it's read visually or spectrophotometrically. Spectrophotometrically. So to conclude, photometric reading is reliable and easy to use, and this will simplify the laboratory workflow uh, as uh, the system is uh, connectable to our list. Uh, this will avoid retranscription errors. So the last things we evaluate is the reproducibility of the Micronaut AM versus a yeast one sensitizer. So what we did is that we repeated uh, 10 times uh, the reading of uh, ATCC uh, 6253, which is a Candida cruzii uh, strain, the same for uh, the ATCC Candida parapsilosis, and also for the SC5350, 14 uh, strain of Candida albicans. And with this, we determined uh, a modal MIC uh, using the sensitizer here indicated by YO modal MIC, okay? And we uh, calculated how much um, uh, observation 
fall in this uh, modal MIC range or is it equal to the modal MIC? And you see that for the yeast one, uh, it, the results are pretty good. And I, I indicated in yellow um, the observation for which the percent uh, of the observation in the modal uh, range uh, is below 90%. And you see that uh, we have uh, five um, yellow cells. We did the same for a uh, micronaut here in red, uh, read visually, and also the same for the micronaut red uh, with a spectrophotometer here in yellow. And you see that in this case, all the observation uh, we have uh, for in more than 90% in the modal uh, range or correspond to the modal MIC. We have only one, um, one uh, observation here uh, for anidula fongine and candida parapsilosis. You, you see that two of the observation for this group uh, were not equal to the modal MIC. So it seems that the micronaut has a slight better uh, reproductibility and repeatability as compared to the, to the yeast one uh, sensitizer. So to conclude this study, uh, we observed that comparison of CLSI versus UCAST growth microdilution susceptibility test is absolutely not trivial and cannot be done by direct MIC comparison, neither by categorization. That the use of genetically characterized strains for antifungal drug resistance is a very good solution to evaluate new antifungal susceptibility testing method. And in this study, we clearly show that yeast one interpreted with CLSI criteria and micronaut AM interpreted with UCAS criteria are equivalent and able to detect elevation of MIC due to point mutations in antifungal resistance genes. We observed that the repeatability reproducibility was slightly better with the micronaut AM. And we also uh, clearly define that the visual and photometric reading of the micronaut AM are equivalent and that the photometric reading can simplify and even improve the laboratory week workflow due to the possibility to be connected to the list. And um, so after that, we decided to um, implement in routine the micronaut AM in our laboratory. With that, I'd like to thank all the people involved in this uh, study. So my boss, Professor Gilbert Krupp, the mycology team of, of, of our institute, the Professor Dominique Sangla, who retired uh, last November, the Dr. Frédéric Lamotte, um, with who I'm working in close contact every day, the people of the diagnostic lab, the head of the lab, uh, Dr. Guy Prodon, and also uh, the technician uh, involved in this study, um, in addition to uh, Nathan. I'd like to thank uh, the bioinformaticians who helped us to analyze all the data, Dr. Chiruti. Uh, I'd like to thank Nicola, who did a wonderful job do doing all these experiments in only uh, two months and a half. And to uh, conclude, I'd like to thank Robert and Thierry from Merlin, who uh, were really um, fine with me, helping me a lot, and uh, with who I had a very uh, fruitful conversation. And with this, uh, I thank you for your attention, and I'm now uh, ready for taking questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of our webinar. Now to our audience, if you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that ask a question box located on the far left of your screen, and we will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Okay, Alex, we already have some great questions coming in, so I'm just gonna dive in here. Starting with question one, how do you rate the differences between UCAST and CLSI methodology and breakpoints? Well, uh, the, the difference is, is really, it doesn't seem it's major, but it's really, you can, we observe that with the difference of MIC we measure, there is, I cannot say there is one, one method which is more, 
more more valuable than another one it depends where you live and uh, what you want but um and clearly that we need an effort to 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 harmonize the two thank you our next question do you see a need for harmonization uh, just a minute someone is writing that we don't hear q a it's possible hmm. Let's see. Uh, I'm hearing it coming through on my end. Um, let me make a note to this person, but let's continue with the Q&A. Um, okay. Uh, it's question two. Do you see a need for harmonization of methodologies and interpretive standards? Yeah, it's, it's in the same way, as, uh, in the same package as the first question, I would say. Uh, clearly, if we want to be able to compare experiments done with one or the other methodology, we need to, to have more harmonization and we also need to fill all these white cells in my table uh, to be able to interpret uh, data. And um, th th there was already one essay of harmonization, which was really helpful, but we still need effort. Thank you, Alex. Our next question. How do you rate the usability of Micronaut 8M in the routine lab workflow? Um, it's, it's, really, it's really easy to use. I mean, the, the, two, the two methods are, are comparable. Uh, they are as easy. Both of them are, are really easy. Uh, and the, the what we experienced in our lab is that we connected, we read Micronaut AM with the spectrophotometer and we send the data directly in the LIS. So this was for us the, 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 a, a very huge improvement as compared as what we did before, uh, because then we don't have to retranscribe the, 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 the results and that, that's really helpful. But it, the Micronaut is really easy to use. Excellent. Now, Alex, based on your study results, which method standard do you recommend to other laboratories? Well, um, it depends where you live, I would say, because if you live in Europe, the, the, the breakpoints and all the, the criteria given by UCAST are based on European epidemiology. So it, it's more reflecting what we will encounter in our labs in Europe. In contrast, if you are in US, uh, I would use CLSI because the CLSI criteria are based on the, on the, the uh, American epidemiology. So uh, there is not one which is better than the other one. It's just depending where you live and, and what you will encounter in your lab. And in our lab, uh, it's why we wanted to, to use Micronaut because it's based on, on the UCAS criteria and it's what we need in a European lab. Thank you. And I think we can squeeze another question here. And this question is two parts. Were the two fungal yeah. assays easy to use? And did you find them relatively user friendly? <laughs> well, they are easy to use uh, from my point of view. Uh, I, I won't say it's as user friendly as doing uh, um, as I can say, um, MIC with a strip or uh, a Kirby Bauer essay with just a um, small, um, I don't know the word in English now. But um, if you want to test several, um, several drugs at the same time, it's the best way. And it's much easier to do a uh, micronaut AM or uh, yeast one sensitizer than doing the classical CLSI or uh, UCAS protocol, I can say, because then it will take very long time. And with the, the, the micronaut AM, it will take, let's say, five minutes. So uh, yeah, it's, it's much longer than just doing a strips, but uh, it's much quicker than doing a full uh, UCAS protocol. Thank you, Alex. And do you have any final comments for our audience? 
Mm. Yeah, I, 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 I propose people to just to try and um, if they have a doubt that it's, it's really, um, it's really easy to use. And I guess that using UCAST in routine, uh, UCAST, using Micronaut AM in routine will, will be more um, helpful for our clinician as in Europe, we are facing uh, um, a, um, European strains. <laughs> and um, also, I would suggest that to use the, the reader, uh, it will give a, 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 a much easier flow in the lab, and but to, sometimes to have a, a high control, especially when you use um, fungistatic drug like azoles and uh, and uh, candida albicans, for example. We know that we have a trailing effect. What I can say that when we use the micronaut AM, we always control this trailing effect, and as you could observe in the data I presented you, the visual reading and the spectrophotometer reading were really comparable, meaning that the software is able really to, to detect this reading. We also uh, added, we uh, Micronaut proposed um, to add um, a compound which will uh, limit the trailing of the strains. Probably it's why we, we didn't observe so, so many difference between reading by eye or reading with the spectrophotometer. But I will suggest to have a, um, a, an eye control, just to be sure that what the, the spectrophotometer give and the soft give uh, is, is the truth. And um, yeah, just to have a, a kind of a quality control sometimes. But from our experience, we never encounter a major difference, never ever. Thank you so much. And I, again, I would like to thank Dr. Alex Koss for her time today and for her important research. Now, if you do have additional questions for Dr. Koss, you can find her email in the biography section of our virtual studio here, but you can also submit them during that on-demand session, um, during our on-demand session. But I do want to thank LabRoots also and our sponsor, Bruker Microbiology and Diagnostics for underwriting today's educational webcast. I want to thank our audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. And again, any questions that we did not have time for today or those submitted during the on-demand period, they will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. Today's webcast can be viewed on demand and Labrador will alert you via, via email shortly when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. We thank you again for joining us. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.